Shalom, praise the Lord. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, class. Uh, we'll begin. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Can I ask Paul to lead us in prayer, please? Uh, let us pray. Father, Almighty God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for yet another day. You have made us to see light today. As we come to class, Lord, call, call upon your Holy Spirit to come and guide us, to come and move with us, to give us understanding of everything that we are going to learn. And we commit everything that we are going to learn, that when we learn them, we we'll practice them, and will bear fruits in the life of especially the young children. We pray and declare all this in Jesus Christ's name. We are prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, so last class, we were basically looking at uh, the uh, Howard Gardner's uh, theory of multiple intelligences. Uh, we looked at uh, seven uh, multiple intelligences, though there are eight. We didn't focus on the eighth one too much. And then we uh, looked at how we can incorporate this multiple intelligences when we are teaching um, uh, children in class. So we basically took up two narratives from the Bible. Uh, one was David and Goliath, and the other was Zacchaeus. And uh, we looked at how we can incorporate these multiple intelligences when we were narrating or when we were going to narrate uh, David and Goliath or Zacchaeus's story. So we looked at, uh, uh, sp uh, we looked at um, linguistic uh, intelligence. Uh, we also looked at logical and mathematical intelligence, how we can incorporate that in um, David and Goliath and uh, Zacchaeus' story. We also looked at uh, musical uh, intelligence. Okay. Uh, did we do musical intelligence? I don't think we did musical intelligence. We did? Okay. So uh, now we we'll move on to spatial or spatial intelligence. So how can we incorporate spatial or spatial intelligence when the rating... Uh, David and Goliath, or uh, Zacchaeus' story. So basically what spatial intelligence is all about is on the screen, the PowerPoint presentation. So you can look at it and think, and you can suggest how we can um, cater to this kind of intelligence. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, maybe I'll start. Um, I think uh, I, I think I already said this example somewhere, like the enacting part uh, of David and Goliath. We can also use some. Um, props for it, uh, like have a team like uh, David and have a team for uh, Goliath and I think that would do a lot of things and uh, now uh, recently I saw uh, like 3D storybooks where we can create, like it's a book and when we open things just pop up and uh, which was nice for the teaching and I think, uh, I mean I'm planning to use it in someday in my teaching and I think even that we can do, it was it was really nice, like uh, to make big trees, big <laughs> David, big Goliath. And when you open the book, the, it it all like they're standing and, and the scenes keep shifting. Some of the things we can use it for spatial intelligence, I think so, yeah. Nice, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Jafina. Anyone else? Lubega, were you saying something? We can't hear you. Anyone else? How we right. can create? Yes, Linda. yes, Linda. Uh, so uh, we can use, uh, uh, you know, creative methods to uh, 
educate the children to enact or to make them understand the real story uh, i'm assuming like a puppet uh, show or kind of a, a picture board uh, kind of initiative to you know narrate the story make them more and uh, you know make the event more realistic and to make them understand uh, the the stories the bible stories better so that it stays with their mind with their heart Yes, thank you, Lyndon. You can use uh, visual aids like, uh, you know, pictures, posters. You can use flannel board with flannel pictures uh, depicting the various scenes um, of these two narratives. And also, like uh, uh, Jeffina said, you can get the children to enact and you can use uh, simple costumes and props, uh, which would be very exciting. And then they can also you know, so linguistic learners will will uh, enjoy this because they'll, you know, have to say some dialogues. Then there'll be bodily kinesthetic intelligence will also enjoy it. Interpersonal will also enjoy it because they're working along with others. The musical intelligence will also enjoy it because they can make some sound in the background and how David comes or the war cry or the war noise that happens in the war, blowing of the trumpet and all of that. So that could be, uh, you know, enacting the whole scene can be really nice, um, which will allow children to basically, you know, physically embody the characters um, and their actions. Okay. So let's move on to the next one, bodily kinesthetic intelligence. So how can we incorporate this in these two narratives for the bodily kinesthetic intelligence? Sepina, uh, next slide, please. No. Okay, how do we incorporate the bodily kinesthetic intelligence? Any thoughts? So it's on your screen. Um, what about this intelligence and how we can um, help these kind of people who have this intelligence? So what can we do for this narrative, for these two narratives? Uh, can we say the body uh, sign language? Can sign language be? Yes, sign language is good, because, like you're saying. Uh, uh, like uh, the deaf and dumb in the church, you can use a sign language to pass across to them a message. Okay. Can you do that? Yes, uh, but basically, since we don't have uh, deaf and dumb children, because they are special children, they spe need special skills uh, for teaching and learning. But yeah, you can incorporate uh, bodily gestures and movements while uh, narrating the story. And also, you can encourage children to, uh, you know, um, act out and do certain actions and mimic the character movements. Okay, so they can be like Goliath who comes and stands and David, you know, with a sling and a small boy, but very confident. So they can uh, act out all of those uh, uh, gestures and those movements, yes. Anything else? Thank you, success. Anything else for bodily kinesthetic intelligence? Um, I think we can also do a dance. <laughs> The dance kind of thing for the slingshot and all this. Uh, there are various songs, so many songs these days, like in the YouTube channel where you find David and Goliath. You can have some music, some dance, and just help them to get the lesson as well. Okay. <clears throat> yes, you can, uh, those who are, you know, uh, would love to do all the choreography and actions and all, you can get them too. Yes. Anything else? You can also organize games where children can, you know, reenact, uh, you know, David and uh, David slingshot throw or uh, Zacchaeus climbing up the tree, you know, or you can even have arts and craft. I remember when, uh, you know, um, 
I think it is way in, in, in the 90s when I was teaching in, in children's church, there's a very beautiful uh, craft that was uh, uh, for, um, I was teaching the kindergarten children, I remember. And uh, you had to just actually punch out this whole uh, uh, craft that was given in each book. Each child has a craft book. And you just had to punch it out in the sides and you'll have the craft ready. And you'll just have to, you know, tie a, a thread behind Zacchaeus. And, you know, you just have to, uh, uh, you know, connect that to the tree, the picture of the tree on the craft um, uh, poster. And, uh, you know, uh, you can you say, you know, Zacchaeus went up the tree and you can pull the uh, string from behind and you know Zacchaeus comes right up the tree and then when uh, Jesus comes there so you have Jesus you know walk uh, his picture there you can you can uh, put Jesus's picture there and Jesus looking up and says Zacchaeus come down and then you put the string down at, from the back again and then you know Zacchaeus just comes down the tree so there's a very uh, very interesting very um, uh, creative uh, uh, craft so you can use all of these you can you find so many available on the internet um, and this can be very very exciting uh, for uh, children you know I have not forgotten it it's almost uh, you know almost 20 25 years uh, since I used it but um, yeah very very interesting so you can uh, use a, a craft which is um, the bodily kinesthetic intelligence will be very excited uh, you can also you know, get them to play a game based on the, this one, uh, on the narratives, uh, which is basically incorporating uh, physical moments, okay? We'll move on to the next one, which is the interpersonal intelligence. So what do you think we can do uh, or incorporate in our lesson uh, to cater to the interpersonal intelligence? Any thoughts, ideas? It's on the screen, so you can read up what about this interpersonal intelligence, and you can uh, think about how we can incorporate this in your narrative or in your lesson plan. I think I can get some kids to, to act out roles. So, for instance, I can not not necessarily looking at this test, but the, but I can get out one who is not um, who is not gifted in height, and I make him to play like Zacchaeus. I take them outside, and he climbs the tree. When he has grasped out what Zacchaeus did say, and uh, the same would apply to David and Gorias. I can get out the one who I can refer to as a shortido, who is somehow young and elongated to act as Gorias, and then play out the uh, an act in a funny way, not really with stones, but uh, with things that cannot hurt each other. So that I can, they, we can try to mimic out the real scene that happened when others are there they be sold somewhere, the camp of the Egyptians this side and the camp of the those Palestinians the other side. I think in so doing, they can all remember what really happened, but I make sure that we keep the real words in the story in the play so that they can really grasp the story. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Lubega. Yes, you can assign roles to different children and get them to narrate. So instead of you narrating the whole story, you can get the children to uh, be part of it. Maybe you can tell them uh, the previous week 
or you can call them up and tell them, you know, uh, and just WhatsApp the uh, the lines they have to say, or uh, you can tell them uh, the, the the previous Sunday, you can just give them uh, small sheets of paper what, you know, they have to speak and they'll be quite excited. Uh, you can involve even the linguistic intelligence, you can involve the um, a special uh, intelligence, you can involve the bodily kinesthetic intelligence as well. And uh, um, so, you know, uh, just assigning different roles to narrate different parts of the story and acting out specific characters. Yes. What else we can do? What do you think we can we we can do for older preteens and teens who don't really like enacting and all of those things? What best can we do to cater to them with this kind of intelligence? I'm just thinking like uh, we can have some quiz, uh, like a competit competition thing or something. But okay. but that too in a creative way, I think we can do it. Not like not like exam papers or something, <laughs> but a little more exciting with some uh, crafts and with some something more exciting. I think last time, uh, once I went with a board game to my class, like uh, the and every answer has makes them to move ahead in the game like seven steps or five steps and they were so excited like who's going first and they were listening to all the details so i think that's also one of the thing even the silent ones uh, like who the interpersonal like they were very uh, active uh, in those things the intraperson intra yes yes thank you uh, jeffina anyone else yeah, board games will be very nice for preteens and teens because they like to, you know, be uh, uh, competitive games, chess, and you know, uh, uh, you know, games that will get them to think. Uh, you know, they uh, they would like that. What else can we do for preteens and teens? It's already there on the screen, so you can. <laughs> the answer is already there. You can have debates and uh, discussions, just throw questions at them. How do you think David felt when facing Goliath? You know, um, why did he use the name of God? Um, you know, uh, uh, you know how um, you can talk about the arrogance of, um, of Goliath, you know, uh, because many te preteens and teens as they're growing up to be very independent and try to be confident, you know, they're being very arrogant. So you can also talk about that and, you know, connect it with their own lives. Um, how he was so overconfident. Um, he was so independent. He tried to do everything by himself. He thought he can do it. He can fight the war. He doesn't even need his soldiers. So you can talk about various um, and connect various issues uh, to their felt need. And you can get them to discuss. And when they discuss and talk about it, it will, you know, uh, it will connect to their own lives and they can learn so much. Even about Zacchaeus, you know, how Zacchaeus, um, uh, you know, um, how sin separates us from God, sin separates us from people, the wrong choices that we make. So preteens and teens are making a lot of choices. So how choices affects their lifestyle, affects their relationships, and how God is interested, uh, you know, not in what we do or who we become, whether we're a tax collector, we have a lot of money, but he's interested in our, uh, you know, our, um, the, the very core of our heart, how we are living our lives. So all these can be good fact, you know, uh, points that we can engage them in thinking, discussing, and talking it out. Okay. Uh, the last one is intrapersonal intelligence. So how can we uh, cater to this kind of intelligence when we are narrating uh, these two narratives or using these two narratives in our lesson plan? Can we have some answers, please, for intrapersonal intelligence? Uh, I think I'm going to say what's on the screen as well, but just the journal thing, I think uh, this generation actually loves journals. Like, uh, they, are, they are very tired of typing on the laptop now. They are actually moving back to writing. And I think uh, we can make them write journals. Like, if you are David and on the day you 
had a battle with Goliath, what you'll be writing on your journal at night. And I think that would help them to react a lot. Like I, I'm, I'm just imagining myself if I fought with Goliath that day. I'd be like, God, thank you so much for all the strength that you gave. There's power on you, and I'm very happy today. Finally, Israel has won, and all this I would have wrote. So I think, I think that's a very creative way because, uh, like in journals now, they use the tapes, the stickers, and uh, some kind of arts in between, some kind of quotes in between. They, we can make them write the memory verse in a journal and all this. I think that would be really exciting. This is just a thought that came in between us. We are, and I'm thinking of doing it on day. Yeah. Thank you, Jafina. Yes, anyone else? I would, uh, I would also tell them to, like, to use imaginative composition. Oh, what are the reasons for David? What did they think? Where are the reasons for David winning the battle, and what are the reasons against Goliath losing the battle? And the same would happen would apply to Zacchaeus' story, and I would ask them what prompted Zacchaeus behave, to behave in that way, and what would they have done if they were in his shoes. In so doing, I'm pulling up their imaginative skills and also making them mimic the Bible stories. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Lupega. Yes, so I think uh, a lot of reflection uh, uh, that can be uh, uh, done with the intrapersonal intelligence, also with others, you know, get them to um, to introspect, connect those, um, the narratives uh, to their own lives, their felt needs, what they're going through, their challenges, you know, like, for example, are you facing any giant or Goliath in your life? You know, how are you going to overcome that giant or Goliath? Uh, you know, um, are you like the, uh, the Israelites who were afraid, timid, anxious, who did not know their God? Are you like Goliath, you know, bold and strong, who knows and has confidence in your God and can trust him, put your faith in him? You know, about Zacchaeus, um, are you living... Um, a life that you know uh, uh, you're doing things that are wrong and you think it's okay because everybody is doing it in school everybody's copying everybody's using uh, bad words everybody is cursing everybody is fighting um, backbiting gossiping and are you like um, Zach is saying it's okay you know because everyone does it it's it's fine um, you know, um, if it's hurting others, I can't help it as far as it's benefiting me. You know, um, you know, I can be copying, but it's okay if, uh, you know, if other people are going to get uh, upset about it, but I'm going to get more grades. So all of these self-reflective questions can be very, very uh, good uh, to think about and to, you know, phrase those and frame those questions and ask them, uh, to think about it and write um, and I think that will help them in a long way especially for uh, you know those who are in grade 6 and above okay so great job everyone thank you for all your inputs um, so by incorporating all of these activities uh, the teacher can basically engage um, children uh, with different intelligences uh, just making your storytelling experience or your lesson plan or your lesson that you're teaching uh, more interactive and inclusive, basically including every child with their various uh, learning styles and also intelligences. It also allows children to connect with the Bible narratives, connect with God um, to make it more personal, uh, to engage uh, with, um, uh, with what you're saying. Um, uh, to understand, uh, to put themselves in that place and to see how they can, you know, how it, uh, they can uh, uh, be blessed through that um, story or the narrative or the lesson that you're teaching. And also it encourages active participation and understanding. Okay. So that is all about uh, Howard Gardner's um, a theory of multiple intelligences. Anyone has any questions, any queries, anything you'd like to say, any doubts? Okay. I take the silence for no. 
Um, so we'll uh, move on. Uh, we look at the divine call and the role of a teacher. Okay, so uh, we'll look at um, who a teacher is, and we we'll look at the roles and the divine call of a uh, teacher. Okay, so I'd like you all to please turn to the book of Lamentations, all of you in your Bibles. Can you please turn to the book of Lamentations? We're basically, we'll be looking at chapter 2 and chapter 4. So if you can open to Lamentations chapter 2, either on your uh, mobile or your the Bible or your laptop, because we're going to be looking at a few scripture passages from there. Okay. So uh, the the divine role and uh, 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 the divine call and the role of a teacher is basically to meet a spiritual uh, need. Okay, when uh, the people of uh, Judah and Jerusalem were carried into uh, captivity, uh, the poor, I mean the very poor, and those who were very very poor, and the you know they were and the children were left behind in uh, Judah and uh, Jerusalem and the prophet Jeremiah was also left back uh, behind with them and um, uh, you know all of them were starving because there was no food there was no ways to procure food for themselves and uh, many of the children were dying of um, starvation okay um, and there was uh, insufficient food and there was no way to procure it, no way to secure it. And look at what uh, Jeremiah does. He cries out. Uh, look at what his cry is in Lamentations chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. Can somebody read that, please? It's on the screen as well. Lamentations chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Anyone can read that? It's on the screen. Lamentations to my yes, go ahead, Rosalind. 11 and 12. My eyes fail from weeping, I am in torment within. My heart is poured out on the ground because my people are destroyed, because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. So, what is uh, uh, thank you, Rosalind? What is um, you know, uh, Jeremiah doing here? He's basically He's weeping, he's pouring out his heart, he's broken, you know, uh, he's pleading uh, with the Lord, uh, you know, for, the, uh, with, uh, for his people. He's weeping and he's praying and uh, he's just basically, uh, you know, uh, worried because the children, the infants are fainting in the streets. They're dying on the streets because there is no uh, food and look at what he pleads with uh, the Lord's people. Okay, what he tells the uh, the people who are left back in the city of Jerusalem and Judah. What he's telling them. I look at uh, Lamentations chapter two, verse nineteen. So, can one of you read that, please? Lamentations chapter two, verse nineteen. Let tears Let run yeah, down like run. a river by day and night. Give thyself no rest. Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Lyndon. Uh, the rest of the uh, you know, two lines are cut off from there. Lift up thy hands towards him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Okay, so basically he's uh, uh, pleading with uh, the the people here, and he's saying, you know, cry out, you know, weep, moan, cry out, uh, you know, to the Lord, lift your faces to the Lord, cry out, uh, so that He can have mercy on you, you know, uh, and have mercy on the life of your uh, your young children who are fainting for hunger in the top of every uh, street. And then we see that, you know, um, Jeremiah is uh, so upset with the people because they're not doing, basically not doing anything about the situation that they are in. And uh, he accuses them basically of being uh, cruel. So let's uh, look at what he says in Lamentations chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Lamentations chapter 4, verses 3 and 4.
I think you can read it from your Bible because there's only half verse that is here. Uh, can somebody read from Lamentation chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, please? Even though jackals present their breasts to nurse their young, but the daughter of my people is cruel, like ostrich in the wilderness. The tongue of the in infant clings to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. Amen. And thank you, Subhashis. So here we see that, you know, Jeremiah is accusing the people of being cruel. And he's saying, you know, um, uh, the, the children are thirsty, but, you know, the parents are doing nothing about, you know, uh, 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 catering to their thirst, giving them water to drink. The children are asking for bread, but there is no one to uh, give them, okay? So the condition of uh, the children in Jerusalem is, I can say, very typical to the spiritual needs of children in certain parts of our world uh, today. Because the children in Jerusalem basically were starving of, for physical food. They had no physical food. But the children today are starving for spiritual food, okay? And children know about God. They know, yes, there is a God, uh, you know, but they don't have a personal relationship with him. You know, uh, children also have a form of godliness, okay? They do everything with a, a, a ritual uh, so that they don't incur the wrath of God or the curse of God or the punishment from God but they deny uh, his power, okay? So there is a tremendous need that needs to be met, just like Jeremiah is telling the people, hey, there is a tremendous pe uh, need, but you, um, uh, you know, parents are not doing anything about it. You know, uh, your children are just fainting, they're, uh, uh, they're dying on the streets, you know, but you're not giving them uh, water to drink and you are not giving them any uh, food to um, eat. So, you know, there is a tremendous need uh, that can be met, you know, if God's people, you know, pray like Jeremiah did and meet the existing uh, need. Okay. Yes, in uh, Judah and Jerusalem, there was a need for uh, physical food, uh, but, you know, there is need today uh, for uh, spiritual food and we have the bread of life. Okay. We have the bread of life, but who, you know, will take it to the perishing millions? So there is a great need, you know, especially in the day and age that we are living today. You know, children are growing faster than their age. They know so much. Uh, even in the kindergarten class, uh, they know so much. You know, I'm um, uh, one of my friends who teaches the kindergarten. She's she's so shocked that some of the things that children uh, say. She said, you know, the children come and say, uh, "You are my boyfriend. You're my girlfriend. I love you." Um, and they want, you know, the boy wants to kiss the girl, uh, and all of those things. And they are, the teachers are so shocked because, you know, in our day and age, we would not even you know, think of all of these things till we come to a certain age uh, level. But now, even in kindergarten, they know everything because they're so exposed to movies, they're so exposed to uh, media, to everything that is happening around them, you know. Um, and so, you know, children um, uh, need uh, spiritual food. And we have the bread of life, that is the word of God, but who, who will take it to the perishing uh, millions, okay. So, uh, there is a great need out there and, uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, minister to the young ones and, you know, at a very early stage. I think it's even in kindergarten nowadays, we just have to speak so much of the word of God into their lives, into their hearts, into their minds, uh, because Satan is taking them so young. Satan is... Uh, destroying their minds, uh, you know, taking their thoughts captive. Uh, but we need to uh, replace all of those lives with the truth of God's uh, word. Okay. So to give this bread of life to children, you know, there are two important things. Uh, one is a messenger and the other is method. 
okay so we need messengers and uh, methods okay now messengers and methods play a crucial role in proclaiming the message um, but you know we know that uh, we are the messengers okay all of you who teach uh, children are the messengers and we also have to employ creative uh, methods that will cater to the children um, in this uh, day and age and also we can you know even as we uh, the methods and messengers play a crucial role uh, in proclaiming uh, the good news of salvation uh, uh, the good news of the gospel but uh, true effectiveness comes only through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we can do it only through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So that is why Jeremiah was saying, you know, telling them, hey, you know, uh, you older people, parents, you know, weep, cry, moan, lift your faces up to God, you know, so that He will hear you. He'll have, have mercy on uh, you. So. Yes, we can employ the best methods, we can be a great teacher, but, you know, true effectiveness comes only through the empowerment of the Holy uh, Spirit. So, uh, the question here we can ask is, why are Sunday school teachers, or why are children's church teachers in such an important position? Can we have some answers, please? Why are children's church ministers? or children's church teachers, or Sunday school ministers or teachers in such an important position? I think we, we are in such an important position because we are given the task of inculcating skills, knowledge, attitude, and values to the next generation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Lubega. Yes, we are, in an, we are all in an important position because we are uh, here to instill godly values, godly standards, uh, you know, their God-given identity uh, at a very young age. Anything else? Um, I think they are laying a foundation uh, at, a, at a young age because uh, I think Whatever I heard in my childhood, I still remember. Sometimes it affects me, whether it's negative or positive. Uh, it has that influence even as after I grew up. So if we have these godly influences at a young age when they grow up, it's, it's really going to help. Yes, you're building on the foundation, you know, and the foundation is so important, you know. Um, and we know that, you know, any building, any structure, uh, people, um, uh, you know, look into the specific and details of the foundation. A lot of money is also and time is spent on the foundation because if the foundation is not uh, uh, good and solid, then, you know, it will not withstand, uh, you know, any uh, pressure or any uh, difficulties uh, that will come its uh, way. Yes. Anything else? I one time I attended a philosophy school like 20 years ago and they were saying that little kids are like new slates, that their brains are so receptive at that age. So whatever we write on their minds between, one, between zero to seven years will stick there for a lifetime. So I think as teachers teaching those little ones at that very age, we must be mindful of what we are writing to, onto their brains because it might stick for the next 90, if not 100 years. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Lubega. Uh, yes, that's so true. You know, uh, just be in, it'll just be imprinted on their hearts and their uh, minds, yes. And uh, also what, uh, you know, we teach these young children, you know, uh, uh, profoundly just impacts their uh, minds. Um, and also it shapes their thoughts, it shapes their emotions, their behaviors. Uh, it influences how children think, feel, and act. So imagine, you know, uh, you just teaching them, you just imparting to them, uh, you just 
telling them it can just be a story from the Bible, you know, but it's going to leave a lasting impression uh, upon how they think, feel, and act for the rest of their um, lives. And it's also going to continue to shape their thoughts, emotions, and uh, behaviors. Okay. So, as adults, you know, if you look at your own lives, most of your thinking patterns, what what you how you think whether it's positive negative where you're very critical you're very analytical you're you know uh, you're very uh, negative uh, or you're very positive uh, you know you have confidence or you lack confidence you think that you can't do it it's all based on your upbringing how your parents taught you how your parents what they spoke about you what they said about you how they treated you how they um, how they uh, your parents uh, relationships the way they spoke to each other how they speak to you even the tone of voice um, you know even the way we the way we say things the way we act all is you know um, actually uh, picked up or received into our senses uh, from our home, you know, so you can, uh, I'm saying this and I'm stressing on it because I want you all to know that as children's church uh, ministers, I don't call them teachers or volunteers, I call them ministers because they're in such an important position, they're there uh, like teachers, they're teaching the word of God, they are like you know, like a pastor who's preaching a, a, a sermon from the pulpit. So I call them, I call our um, children's church uh, ministers, uh, teachers who teach in children's church, I call them as children's church ministers because I want them to see it's not just a voluntary job, but they are ministers, they're ministering. They're ministering the word of God. They're teaching the word of God. And it, the importance of what they are doing and the importance of how they need to prepare. Because if you're a minister of God and you're going to preach um, from the pulpit, you won't take it lightly, right? You are going to spend time uh, to prepare your message, to see there's a flow, to see that, uh, you know, you have uh, apt illustrations and everything. You go well prepared. Uh, so also when you come to teach children, you don't... Um, take them for granted you don't take them oh they're just children i can i know the story i can just go and tell them about um, you know uh, how god divided the red sea or you know how god provided mana and quail if that is what your lesson plan is uh, uh, all about but you're going to look at you know hey this is a narrative this is just a story but what truths am I going to bring out that is going to impact their lives it's going to impact how they think feel and act so I want you all to see the importance of um, ministering to children not that just you can say anything and everything or you know they're just uh, they're not going to give you any feedback on how well you preached or how well you prepared your sermon or they're not going to find out whether you did your homework and you came uh, but you know the importance that hey I'm here having you know whether it's one child or three children but i'm having these children here uh you know the things that i'm going to speak into their lives or teach them is going to really uh you know impact their young minds it's going to actually shape them it's going to shape and mold their thoughts their emotions their behaviors the way they think they feel and act and when you Think about the bigger picture of what you are going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you're doing or uh, what, uh, you know, the, the the position that God has called you into, the ministry that God has called you into. And also as parents, also as um, as whether you're teaching in a school or, you know, if you have uh, y young ones in your home, whether you're an uncle and an aunt or a niece or you have your niece, nephews, you know, uh, the importance of how you behave, the importance of what you're saying to them, what you're imparting to them is actually going to influence and shape their minds for the rest of their uh, lives. So, you know, it's so important that uh, we give thought to uh, the way that we live, the things that we say, the way that we uh, engage uh, with the husband and wife, that children are watching us, you know, and also as uh, adults in church, how we how we dress, how we act, how we talk, how we walk, you know, is all going to, is all impacting our uh, young ones, okay? So, uh, 
children's church ministers are in such an important position and I want us to see the important position that we are in that God has placed us and to take that uh, very, very seriously. Okay. Now, what could cause a teacher to have such an impact on a young person's life? What do you think uh, would cause a children's church minister or a teacher to have such an impact on a young person's life? Or what do you think you need to do as a children's church minister or a teacher to impact a young person's life? Any thoughts? Um, I think prayer is one of the most important thing uh, that we should do. And uh, our motives are not about teaching. And it's not a job. It's not a volunteer thing, as you said. When we even look at the ministers in the Bible, we, ha we should have that heart for them, uh, for them to grow in Christ. And one of the things I think the most powerful thing that is to pray for them is to literally uh, intercede for them, for their protection, for their guidance, and also to be well prepared. Uh, I think that's one of the things we've uh, seen throughout the classes that sometimes people are very logical when it comes to children's states. Like, hey, I'm just going to say a story and it's going to keep them engaged. But I think it's more, it's definitely not think I'm very convinced that it's more than that. It's, it's, a, it's a ministry where we are dedicated, uh, we have given uh, all our efforts, all our time, all our thinking, all our uh, passion and desire and so that they will be uh, brought up because whenever I, I go and teach, I look at some of, sometimes I remember my younger self and then I wonder what if I had all these teachings, I would have been so blessed, I would have got saved very early in my life would have grown so strong in Christ and uh, I mean that kind of heart should be there that whenever we see them they are going, they are going to be the next generation bringing up the word of God and, and it's amazing when when you accept Christ at a young age I always remember I, I got saved when I was 16 and the very first thought that came was oh I wish I got saved earlier <laughs> I wish I got saved earlier would have made better decisions would have would have had a beautiful uh, like satisfied uh, times in the in the pre-teens of my life so I think uh, this should be the motive and the prayer and the heart should be in a, in a right position so that we can be effective and also to be well prepared really take it uh, as a work that we are doing for God Thank you, Jafina. Yes, uh, to be well prepared to pray. Anything else? What would cause a teacher or a children's church minister to have uh, such an impact on a young person's life? Yes, Divya. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about kids uh, maybe who are in their, you know, eight, seven to seven, uh, age seven and up. Uh, those kids especially look at our lives, right? How we react, how we respond. Um, so I believe uh, our dependence on the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, even even during those, uh, while we are teaching, maybe there could be situations where we can get so annoyed or we can get so impatient, but how we handle those situations, that can make an impact. So uh, I have heard someone saying this, like it's it's not in a children's uh, church context, but uh, like in a work atmosphere, uh, right? Uh, uh, some people don't uh, like remember what work we did, but they remember how uh, we made them feel or how we treated them. Mm -hmm. So maybe they are not uh, like even for kids, they are not, uh, they may not say the words or they may not <laughs> understand everything that has been taught, but um, I feel to have that lasting impact on them is how we treat them or how we respond to them. And uh, sometimes uh, we can get so caught up in teaching them and forget that, uh, uh, you know, the simple things uh to uh that can make an impact so i feel rather than doing a lot of talking maybe uh in in throughout deeds they see i feel they don't uh, because uh, as i see my children <laughs> whatever i would say uh, or if i give them a long lecture 
nothing gets into their head. But if they see me doing something, for example, if I do quiet time, they will do quiet time, even without me telling them. So I see that doing is much important than you know doing a lot of talking. Yeah. Very true. Thank you so much, Divya. Yes, that's so important. Uh, being who, you know, being Christ-like in front of them uh, with the empowering of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, just uh, through our actions, uh, what we say to them, how we uh, react uh, is more important than basically what we teach. Yes. So we'll go for our break and we'll come back and look at four things that would cause a teacher or a children's church minister to have impact on a young person's life. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> 